right, the first passage I want to go through is James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. All right? Can I get one of the pastors to read it for me? James 13, 513. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he, was, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amen. So look at this. If any of you are suffering, how many people are going through trials right now? Suffering. The Bible says that you should pray. Cast your cares upon him, right? How many of you guys are cheerful in the joy of the Lord? The Bible says you should sing psalms. That means sing, worship him, praise him, right? But then the Bible says if any among you is sick, it says to do what? Call for the elder of your church and let him pray over you and he'll anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. That means all your sins will be forgiven. Everything. So do we see a correlation with sin and sickness here? What does sin do to us? It causes condemnation and guilt. The law is what tests us morally of sin. It allows us to know that we fall short, that we can't uphold the whole law. All 613 Mosaic laws, impossible. The only one who did it was Jesus. Amen. But that's why he came to do what he did, which is fulfill the law by never sinning, giving himself as a perfect sacrifice on the cross. So now we have atonement through his blood. Hallelujah. But the Bible is saying here, if you're sick, you should go to the elders. And the, the prayer of faith. That's the prayer of someone who knows their identity in Christ, who knows they've been forgiven, who's been there and done that, that will pray for you so that you will get out of that guilt and condemnation. And the Bible also says to confess your trespasses to one another. Everyone look around. Look at your brothers and sisters. This is a church body. This is the body of Christ. And when you confess your sins to one another, you'll be healed. So there's a revelation with, there, there's a correlation with confession and healing. So some people are sick because they haven't let go of that sin that's been tormenting them. They're still believing in their mind that they're not worthy and they're spiritually sick or physically or both. And usually people who are spiritual, spiritually sick, it, it goes to the physical. Is it all the time the same thing? No. But most of the time it is. I've seen people who are in condemnation that think they're not worthy, confess their sins, know, catch that revelation of the blood and that they've been forgiven and get completely healed. I've seen people delivered from demons the minute they release the things they've been doing because they hold on to that sin and think they're not worthy and think they're too dirty and think the sin is too much and they stay bound in confusion and double-mindedness. They stay bound in whatever pressures and prides and rejections, all those things. They stay in it because they don't believe they can be forgiven. And the Bible says that you should confess it to someone who, who understands who they are in Christ and that that prayer will deliver you, will heal you, and that all your sins will be what? Forgiven. Does that mean we need to go to a Catholic priest? No, that's not what this means. But the Catholic church will take this and use that as something to, to, that justifies what they do. But this is completely different. This is talking about the church body. Can I call my brother and sister in Christ to confess some things I've been going through and I'll be healed by their prayer? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person. Who's righteous? Every single person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. But what's the difference between a newborn Christian and an elder? An elder understands their identity and knows they're not condemned because they've been through processes to stand firm on who they are in Christ so they can confirm to a newer Christian, hey, you've been forgiven. Yeah, you've done these things. It's okay. I'm going to pray for you. You are forgiven, my brother and my sister. The word says it. Jesus says it. And when that person confirms that to you and prays for you, you're all of a sudden all delivered. Now the whole week, all the things you've been going through, that condemnation, yes. Do we hate sin, body of Christ? Yes. yes. But we should never let sin take control of us. Should we have a desire to want to, to live a holy lifestyle? 
Should we want to live a lifestyle full of, of righteousness, seeking his righteousness, right? Yes, we're made righteous, but the Bible says seek his righteousness. righteousness. That means get to know who Jesus is and be, so you can become like him in your soul. But should sin, when we fall, when we mess up, should it ever keep us down to the point where we can't get back up? No. That's what the devil wants you to believe. There are people in here tonight, because I had a whole other sermon I was going to preach. And the Holy Spirit on the way here told me to switch the sermon and preach on this. Does God want you to be sick? No. He never wants you to be sick. Does God want you to be suffering and, 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 and whatever sickness that the doctors are saying you have? No, that's, God does not put sickness on you. God wants you to stand firm that he's healed you on the cross, that by the stripes he took, by the sin that he took in his body, by the sickness he took on his body, you are healed by the stripes of Jesus. You are healed by what he did. He wants you to know that. And when you know that, everyone say no, no. and it hits your heart, that's when healing begins to manifest miraculously. That's when deliverance begins to manifest miraculously. Do you know why so many Christians are bound to demons? Because Christians can be bound. you know why? Because they don't know that who the Son set free is free indeed. It's a revelation. But I can quote that all day and then all of a sudden I slip and I fall and I slip and I fall. And if I don't really believe that and the enemy is able to whisper into my mind, now I can be oppressed by a spirit simply because I don't know who I am in Christ. But when I come before his throne room of grace with boldness, what happens? The sin, what happens to the sin? Wiped. Hallelujah. What happens in baptism? We wash our what? Our sins, our body, our old self is dead. And we rise up a new creation. So in the cultural and religious context back then in ancient Jewish and Christian practices, the elders were respected leaders in the community, right? And the sick individual seeking help would come for healing, and the anointing oil had a medicinal, right? Back then, oil had a medicinal, still does, effect, but also a symbolic role. It represented the Holy Spirit. This oil represents the Holy Ghost, the power of the Spirit to heal you and deliver you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be schizophrenic and come before the Lord and confess your sin and forgive those who've hurt you and be completely healed of schizophrenia. You can be diagnosed. No, I'm telling you, it's real. There's people in here who have been diagnosed schizophrenic. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Some of you tonight need to confess that to the Lord and say, Lord, I believed in this lie, which is, a, which is not of God. I confess that to you, and you'll be healed and completely delivered from that lie of the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's real. I've seen it happen too many times. I've seen people who were diagnosed with bipolar disorder, PTSD. I've seen people who are diagnosed with depression, anxiety, taking pills their entire life. Come to the altar with a simple revelation of knowing that God wants to deliver them, that he wants to set them free. And when they release it, the Holy Spirit delivers them, heals them, and they leave here free. I'm just being real. It's for us, body of Christ. God wants us to walk in freedom. He doesn't want us to walk bound with demons and lies because how can we ever do what he's called us to do when we're constantly thinking about what we've done that's wrong? Amen. I'm talking about true Holy Spirit-filled Spirit -filled believers who want to walk this walk out for real. Amen. Because the Bible says if you're double-minded, you're unstable in what? All your ways. All right, let's continue. So we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was buried for our iniquities. The chastisement, chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. So that means, that what does chastisement mean? Somebody quickly, come on. Huh? Discipline, right? When you're chastised, like it's like, give me an example, like, like a father disciplining his child with a belt, right? A spanking, right? That's chastisement. So he was chastised for our peace. What does that mean? That means he was beaten. He was whipped. He was scourged so that we can have peace. Because through that physical and spiritual suffering that he went through, we now have atonement for our sin and cannot be tormented by sin any longer. And it says right here, 
He was wounded for our transgressions. Transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is our willingful sin from our past life. Our, our, th those of us who were fornicating and didn't care. Drinking and smoking and didn't care. Gossiping and lying and cheating and stealing. That we all deserve death because of. He suffered for that. He was bruised. He was wounded. He was chastised so that we can say, God, I'm forgiven even though I used to be like this. I'm now born again. And if I continue to fall and get back up, you're always going to wash me. He wants us to stand in that revelation so that the devil has no more hold over us. Hallelujah. This is what he went through it for. He didn't go through the suffering physically and spiritually so that we can still be bound, always thinking about a legal right. Is legal right real? Of course it is. But we shouldn't be seeking and searching. I've been through that, guys. Where I'm constantly looking for legal right here. Legal right. Maybe it's this. Maybe. What if God is saying, just stand on my truth. Believe what I say. He doesn't want us confused. Some of you are trying to figure out, why do I keep going back to the cycle? Is it because of this? Is it this generational curse? Our generational curse is real. Our sin cycle is real. Of course. But if you prayed and said, God, I break this generational curse in the name of Jesus, and you believe it, and you've gotten somebody else, maybe an elder or somebody to pray for you, it's broken. That's it. There's no more trying to go and pray and pray and pray and pray against the same generational curse over and over again. What type of prayer is that? We pray, we believe, and it's done. And we stand on truth. Standing on the truth is actually what keeps all that away. But these familiar spirits keep coming back around and keep, keeping you bound because you're thinking, I haven't broke the curse yet. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not righteous enough. I'm not holy enough. I haven't fasted long enough. I haven't prayed long enough. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Where in the Bible does God say, focus on these things and focus on all these demons and demonic things and don't focus on me? The Bible says to focus on him. That we're supposed to be keeping our eyes on Jesus, the finished work of the cross, keeping our mind in heavenly places, not in hell. We are supposed to keep our mind in heavenly places, right? Because we're seated in heavenly places, right? Not in hell. We're not supposed to be thinking about demons and, and hell and, le and, and oppression all the time. That's what keeps you in a cycle of a whole other side of religion. Do Christians, do, can a Christian get deliverance and healing? Of course. But should we be focusing on that and freaking out all the time? No. Sometimes God just wants you to stand on truth. Just because you're going through a storm, is it because you did something wrong? Let me tell you something. It's a lot more simple than we think. Some of us are going through storms because of things we did wrong, but we know what we did. <laughs> it was something that we decided free willingly, premeditated. We did it and did it and did it, and we understand that there's consequences. We get it. But does God always want us seeking? When we're going through a storm, what did I do wrong? Am I, is it me, God? Is it me? I, what did I do wrong? Oh, my gosh, I didn't pray long enough. Or, uh, uh, that's, not what it, that, that's not how God wants us to think. He wants us to stand on truth and say, God, you're putting me through this storm to get me stronger. You're building up my character and my hope and my perseverance. You're, you're, you're building my strength so I can get stronger in the spirit so that I can become more like Jesus Christ. But if we're constantly, look, if you're, look it's very simple. If you're, in, if you're in fornication, you're probably going through a constant storm because you won't repent. Duh. If you're smoking and drinking, you know the regular stuff. If you're doing these things that you know you shouldn't be do, duh. You're welcoming the enemy in. But once you've said, God, I'm done with the world, I'm done with all these sinful things, I'm following you, and, you sold, and you're sold out for Christ, that's it. You go through storms, the Bible says you're supposed to rejoice. You're supposed to say, woo! Oh, this thing happened at my job, they let me go for no reason. Oh, a big blessing's coming, the devil mad. Oh, hallelujah. That's how we're supposed to be, oh, oh. This, oh, my marriage, is it getting attacked? Oh, okay, devil. I'm going to go pray and worship God. I'm going to go seek him and rejoice because there's about to be a breakthrough that's coming soon. A family member's getting saved. You see, the enemy wants to attack your weak points. And God allows them because that thing that the devil thought would kill you only gets stronger. So that weakness turns into a strength, and now you've overcame that area, and you go to the next level of faith and glory, and the enemy's mad once again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everyone say forgiveness. forgiveness. All right.
Let me continue. Hold on. All right, we're going to go to uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Let's talk about the, the importance of confession real quick before I get into forgiveness. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does this mean we need to get saved over and over again? Does that mean that if we sin, we got to go and confess our sins or is it to be saved again? Should we be in the secret place like, God, I did this. Oh, God, please save me. I don't want to go to hell. Let's be real. How many of y'all been moving like that? Come on. You can be real. Okay. I, I see a few hands up. Sometimes. Okay. So there's a difference between conviction and condemnation, right? Conviction is when we know we sinned and fell short, but we don't let it get us to the point where we think we're condemned to hell. I, I, but still, the Lord wants you to get out of that so that you can have a, a healthy, godly sorrow like a best friend. So I, I always give this example. My mother, I love her. I die for my mother, right? And I always give this example. So if I was in the kitchen and I was grabbing something out of the cabinet and she comes in the kitchen and I don't see her and I accidentally elbow her in the face and she starts bleeding. I love my mom. That was an, I, I didn't mean to do I didn't want to do that. What am I going to probably do? I'll probably start tearing up. Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you okay? I'm going to pick her up. I'm going to say, Mom, I'm so sorry. Guys, let me help you get you something to wipe. I'm going to, I'm going to care, right? But do I think, am I, am I going to be freaking out saying, Mom, don't disown me. Don't disown me. Don't disown me, Mom. Don't disown me. Don't disown me. Please, please don't disown me. I'm your son. No, I'm not going to do that because I know even though I've, did, I've done that, my mom forgives me. She knows that I made a mistake. She already loves me. And she's going to stay. She's going she's to continue to be my mother. I'm going to continue to be her son. And she's going to get back up and say it's okay. But what is that going to cause me to do because of my sorrow for that situation? The next time I'm in that kitchen and I, and I go to grab something, I'm going to look and not make that mistake again. Repentance. Godly sorrow leads to change. Repentance. Confession is acknowledgement of what you've done wrong, coming before the Father and saying, Father, this is what I've done wrong. I know I was wrong. It, 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 the, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you where you could have done better. It could have been maybe you haven't been praying like you should. Maybe God's saying you need to go on a fast. Maybe the Lord is saying you're not in your word. Maybe it was simply because you just went through something and you just you didn't, you didn't overcome it. By the Holy Spirit, you were in the flesh. Does it happen to everybody? Yes, but the Lord wants us to recognize this, come before him and confess. We're not confessing for salvation. We're confessing because we love him. Does this make sense? We need to confess, and he washes our sins. But the Bible says, Pastor Joel, that we've been wiped clean of all our sins from the past, the present, and the future. Then why do we have to keep on confessing? Can somebody give me a quick explanation? If we can get the microphone for them, I want to hear the crowd. Let's get interactive. Quick. Forgiveness is a free gift. He's offering it constantly. But if you never try to take it, you can't receive it. So you have to confess so that you can receive that forgiveness. Amen. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I like that. Anybody else? Okay. This is good. That means the majority of people have, in here have no idea what's, about, like, what's going on. So we've been forgiven for all our sin. Right? Doesn't the Bible say this? When we come to Christ, we've been forgiven. This is the gospel, guys. You're about to learn something tonight. Amen? Amen. Okay, this is good. It's, it's, it's positionally we've been forgiven for everything. So then why do we have to continue to, con to confess to God? If we've been forgiven, then why do we have to confess? That's it. I can keep living however, however I want to live, right? If he already forgave my sin, then why do I have to confess? I should just be saying, God, you already forgave me. I'm good. You already forgave me. I'm good, right? When I, when I curse or, or I get mad or, or, or somebody, somebody, somebody people, some people are here watching porn and, and made a mistake. and uh, you should, uh, uh, you, Don't worry about it, God. You already forgave me anyway. Just, that's it, right? So why do we confess if we've already been forgiven? The heart, that's good. I can't, huh? God, okay, that's part of it. Yes, fear the Lord. You have reverence and respect to God. Amen. Okay, so the Bible says, I heard, I, heard, I heard process of sanctification. But the Bible says we've been completely sanctified, but the Bible also says we're being sanctified. What's going on? Is the Bible a lie? I've taught this. I want you all to catch this for real quickly. 
the spirit man is forgiven and the spirit man is sanctified, but it, ha it has to process through the soul to get to the body. Amen. Like, That's good. Yeah. So he's given a revelation of, the, of our triune nature. So our spirit, we have a spirit, soul, and body. Thank you, Jesus. Spirit, soul, well, I'll put this here. Soul and body. Uh, soda water. You got some. Uh, this. Holy Spirit, soul, living water, right? And body. All right. So when we come to Christ, okay, so before we come to Christ, our spirit is what? Dead because of what? Sin. But when we receive the Holy Ghost by putting our faith in Christ, ding, our spirit man's alive now. We're perfect. Hallelujah. We got the oil. Hopefully yours is filled to the top. And it's, all right. But then in our soul, we might have a whole bunch of stuff from our past trauma, been molested, parents weren't in our lives, whatever it is, all up in our mind, will, and emotions, right? Because we're babies in the faith. And the, this right here is what's being washed. So we're fully sanctified by the Holy Spirit in our spirit, man. That means we receive everything that Jesus, the Father gave the Son, right? It's passed to us. We're co-heirs, meaning we receive full inheritance. That means deliverance is ours. Full healing is ours. That means prosperity is ours. That means peace is ours. Joy is ours. Right, Joe? Love is ours. Everything is ours, right? Family members getting saved, that's ours. Everything is a heaven, that's ours. But we're, it's the Bible says we're seated in heavenly places, but we're still here on earth. Is the Bible a lie? No. In our soul... We go through a process of sanctification. Even though we've been fully sanctified, now in our soul, which is who we are, we are being cleansed, washed, and becoming more and more like who? Like Jesus. So you go through your first year in Christ, and you go through a process of forgiving your father, mother, and people who hurt you. Praise the, you said you went to the altar, you, you said, I forgive, I forgive. A month goes by, your father calls you, and then you feel something. Oh, what was that? Oh, I thought I forgave him. I forgave him bitterness oh, oh, oh. and the Lord starts taking you back and giving you dreams of when your father did this when you were 10 or when your friend did this when you were 13 and now you're getting you're like why am I getting these dreams and the Holy Spirit is like because I want you to face it so you can let go of it and release it to me right you're waking up like that was a demonic dream no it wasn't that was the Holy Spirit trying to show you this is an area of your life that you haven't released to me, that you have hidden in your heart and your soul, that you're fragmented, where there's parts and bits and pieces that you need to let go so he, the Holy Spirit can come and restore it. So then what happens is you begin to get healing, deliverance. The Word of God begins to renew your mind. You begin to change the way you think, your perspective. So now in your soul you're becoming more and more like who? Jesus and what's constantly trying to get you away from this process so like the Holy Spirit is the one who's oil 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 okay you open this room where you were molested when you were 10 now the Holy Spirit oil 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 now who's trying to get you out of that oil doors being cleansed who, the flesh so now you got the things of the world and the devil so now the world the, the temptation the money the drugs the alcohol the things you used to really like the the sex you got the you got the the, the 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 devil lying and whispering in your ear the world and the devil and the flesh working together right the world they're working together to get you to rely on them go back to the alcohol go back to the the weed you gave it up at the altar it's okay you can give it up at the altar in two months or something like that you can go to another revival you don't got to go to church. You are the church now. You're saved. Right? You don't got to separate from your friends who are smoking weed every day. Maybe you'll bring them to Christ and you try to go hang out with them and you smoke weed. See? Don't worry about it. Just go back to the weed. You'll never get over it. That's the flesh, the world, and the devil. But the one who says no, maybe you fell. Okay. Fell. I need to go pray. Hallelujah, Father. Thank you. Now the oil is... Now you're... Not walking, gratifying the desires of the flesh, but now you're walking in the spirit. Does this make sense? Good. Because there's a lot of different doctrines out there. You got hyper grace where they think, oh, don't ever confess and repent. They, they look, they'll, they'll go to a person who's in the streets smoking and drinking trans transvestite homeless, and say, don't worry about it. The Lord sees you righteous. No, he does not. They have to what? repent they have to make the decision right spirit man dead in their soul to say jesus i need a savior that's when the blood is applied 
and you begin that sanctification process. But until then, if you love the things of the world and the flesh more than you want Jesus, you'll stay right there. And when you die, if you're walking in the flesh and your, your spirit man is not made perfect and you haven't received the Holy Ghost, where do you go? You go to hell. Because you're separated from who? God. Makes sense. Yes, we have a fleshly body, body suit, and it sucks. But we do things like fasting and praying. And as we do these things, the flesh keeps getting. Stomping on the flesh. Stomping on the devil. Hearing the, 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 voice, the, 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 the Lord's voice louder. Now you're getting words of knowledge. Now you're starting to cast out demons and win souls. And now you're moving in more love than you ever did before. Now you have such a light on you. You go around your old friends and you have the power, the revelation, the maturity now to just walk into the atmosphere. And they start manifesting and freaking out like, who are you? You're not the same. They feel something. Because you took a year of consecration, coming to church, being active in discipleship, learning and growing, and you got fired up, you got armed up, and now when you go to war, you're not just an easy pushover. Now you have so much oil, it's overflowing, that the oil begins to touch other people. That's how it works. Now do y'all, does it make sense? I'm going to give y'all some more visuals in a second. So the ongoing confession is important not to gain salvation again, but to maintain healthy intimacy with God. We are always forgiven positionally, but sin can disrupt our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Confession helps us restore that fellowship and keep our hearts aligned with His. Confession is a gift for us. Sin, naturally, it's unstoppable. It produces guilt. Even if you try to act like it doesn't, it will produce. Because that's why the hyper grace preaching, when they say, oh, don't worry about confession, you know what that leads to? A buildup, a buildup, and then an explosion. Now you're in condemnation again. We got to be balanced. Works don't save us, but we also know we have to have a relationship with God. So it's not about hyper grace. It's that middle where grace abounds, sins abound. It's where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I can confess my sin to my Lord and he'll continue to wash me. I'm already forgiven positionally, but I ask for forgiveness because I love him. I'm not asking God for forgiveness because I'm going to hell. I'm already forgiven. I'm saying, God, forgive me because I love him. Does that make sense? It's like I gave, I gave this revelation early to somebody. I forgot who it was. I was talking to him on the phone. I, I, I was a friend back in, in um, a different state. And, and he was calling me about, you know, some brothers that were praying for because they're stuck in this crazy doctrine. And I was like, man, it's like my wife. Like she tells me one day, hey, babe, I need, I need you to take out the trash, right? And I'm like, yeah, I got you. I'm going to take out the trash. But I get caught up in my word and prayer and, 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 and on the phone and, and I forget and I leave. And then I come back and my wife's like, and I'm like, oh, shoot. I forgot. I'm sorry. Is my wife going to say, okay, now I'm divorcing you. I'm done with you. That's it. Leave the house. That'd be crazy, right? Right? But I should, now, now imagine if I did this. My, my wife told me to take out the trash. I, I came home and I said, oh, yeah, I didn't take out the trash. You know why? Because I'm married to you. You're not going to leave me anyways. I'm, you're going you're to forgive me anyways. So that's it. Bye. Boy, she's bomb. Nah, she don't do that. But you see what I'm saying? Wouldn't that suck if somebody that you care about just neglects it and says, so what? You're not going to leave me anyways. And that's what hyper grace is. They believe, don't confess and repent. Just keep saying that I'm forgiven and I'm washed and I'm clean anyways. So I don't have to worry about nothing. No, that, that, you know what that makes the Holy Spirit do? It makes the Holy Spirit a little angry in a righteous way. Then the Holy Spirit is going to be like, oh, yeah, that's how you feel? You don't want to have a relationship with me? Let me back up real quick and let some things happen to you. And then you'll be walking in the flesh thinking you got it. Bop, 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 bop. Make sense? Everyone say relationship. relationship. Let's talk about this one. John chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash your feet, wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Who's that not all of you? Judas. So let's talk about foot washing. Back then in Jewish, um, in, 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 in Jewish culture, Walking around in, you know, in sandals was common. There was a whole bunch of dirt. People's feet were stinking dirty, nasty. 
black toes, all types of crazy stuff. Nasty, right? They didn't have Nike and Reeboks back then. It was, it was, it was, it was toe Jordans, like uh, sandal Jordans, whatever that is. That they used to walk around with those, those Jesus sandals. You know what I'm talking about? So people's feet were stank and dirty. So when you came into homes, servants would wash your feet. That was a lowly position because people's feet stunk. So if you were the servant in the house that had to wash the feet, it really sucked. Because they're all day walking around on those feet. They just came out with the technology of a sandal. So they, they didn't have the padding and the cushion and the gardening. It was, it was dirty, right? So that was a lowly position. And Jesus gave them a revelation of what we're constantly doing with him when we come before him and confess. Water baptism washes what? The sins of your body, right? Everything. Your whole body dies under that water. But what is Jesus constantly doing, right? When we come before him in intimacy, washing our dirty feet. It's a constant foot washing. Jesus is constantly washing our feet, our sin, when we come before him in intimacy, saying, Jesus, I confess, he's consistently washing our dirty sin, a lowly position. He came to be a servant, not to be served. That's what, that's what confession progressively means. Jesus washing our feet. This is a, a passage that takes place during the Last Supper. When Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So let's break down the verse. Again, in the cultural and religious context of that time, washing feet was a task reserved for the lowliest servant. Feet would become dusty from travel, and it was customary for hosts to offer water for foot washing, but rarely would someone of high status perform the task themselves. Peter's strong objection, right, reflects his reverence for Jesus as he couldn't even fathom his Lord taking on the role of a servant. Peter initially fails to grasp the, sim the symbolic significance of Jesus' actions and his reaction reflects a common theme that we see all throughout the Gospels where Peter is super zealous but often misunderstands spiritual truths, right? So Jesus introduced a deeper spiritual meaning of his actions here. The foot washing represents more than physical cleansiness. It's a symbolic of the spiritual cleansing that Jesus offers through his sacrifice, his blood. The phrase, no part with me, underscores that accepting Jesus, cleanse, Jesus' cleansing is essential to belonging to him. He highlights the necessity of being cleansed by him consistently, which points to the greater washing, which is salvation through his atoning sacrifice, right? Baptism. Without the spiritual cleansing, one cannot fully participate in the, in the kingdom of God. You see, Z Z Peter, when he says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, right? Once Peter understands that, his wa that the washing is crucial for being in relationship with Jesus, he responds with his typical enthusiasm. His request for Jesus to wash his hands and head shows that he wants to be fully cleansed. He goes from resistance to over-eagerness, demonstrating his deep desire to be fully aligned with Christ, which is good. Peter had a bunch of zeal. Everyone say zeal. Peter was still slightly, he still slightly misunderstands the nature of the washing. While his enthusiasm is admirable, Jesus is using this, this, this symbol as, symbolism as a specific metaphor for spiritual cleansing, which does not require full body washing. So, Jesus clarifies that Peter and the other disciples, except Judas, is already clean. Why? Because of their faith. Who didn't have faith in Jesus? Judas. That's why he betrayed him. The other disciples had faith in who he was, and, and they followed him, right? Everyone say follow. So their faith and their position as his followers already made their body clean, right? They've already received the bathing of salvation, but they still needed what? Daily cleansing symbolized by the foot washing. Does this make sense? Jesus teaches that once a person has been spiritually cleansed, salvation, right, salvation, they do not need to be washed again. However, in daily life, Christians pick up dirt, which is sin and spiritual struggles, which need ongoing cleansing through confession and sanctification. This ongoing washing is part of the Christian journey of spiritual growth. Make sense? I want to give you guys an image of how it looks. I want somebody, I want Pastor Joel, you're going to come up and you're going to be a representation of the Holy Spirit. All right? 
Can everybody see what's going on up here at this altar? Can y'all see? So what I have right here, can y'all see what's inside here? Probably not. So what's inside of here right now is a bunch of dirt. All right? Can y'all see that? And what we have right here is a whole bunch of what? Water. So I'm going to give you guys a, a visual that you'll never forget for the rest of your life so you can understand that you've been washed, but daily or when you get into prayer, you need to wipe off that dirty dirt. And Jesus wants to do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to get dirty for y'all. So y'all never forget. I'm going to get my feet nice and stank for y'all. If y'all want to come up here and see my, my ugly feet, you can. Hey, don't judge me. I got to hide my toes. All right. So again... When we go through daily struggles, when we fall short, let's say we judge somebody in our heart. You know when you judge somebody in your heart and you tell somebody and you feel like you're better and you have covetedness in your heart or you want what they have or you envy them, you know that's sin. Jesus searches the what? The Holy Spirit searches the hearts and the minds. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will eventually speak. So this is us wanting that car. We should get a visual. Bring that, yeah, smart guy. Come over here. Come on. Get that thing up here. So this is what happens. We get a whole bunch of dirt. Put that on the visuals for the online viewers too. I want everybody online to see it. So when we, when we decide we want to covet and envy people and say, man, how did they get that car? Why am I working so hard and I don't, and I don't have the car that they have? That's when we get some of this, some dirty dirt on our feet. Then you go throughout the day. That's the morning time at your job. 12 o'clock hits and you look at the girl the wrong way for too long. You just lusted. You might have looked away, but you looked at the girl for too long, or you looked at the guy for too long. Or for the girls in here who want to get married, you looked at that girl and said, why is she married and I'm not married yet? In your heart. But then you saw her and you said, hey, what's up, girl? God bless you. <laughs> Does it happen? It's normal. We're humans. It's the human nature. Is that sin? Yes. Some of you. In the car. On the road. You're chilling. Playing some worship music. On the highway, all of a sudden that guy cuts you off. Beeping the horn. You swerve. What you doing, bro? Make sure. Is that sin? You got angry. That wasn't Christ like. Some of you, you get home and you're chilling on your phone scrolling. All of a sudden you, you go across that wrong video. Now you're watching pornography and you're like, dang, man. Is that sin? That's some more dirt. Somebody give me some sin that right now you're dealing with in your life that sucks, that you want to get rid of. Bitterness. So some of you got hurt years ago. That person forgot about who you are, not even thinking about you, but you still remember them because you were so hurt. That bitterness is a lot of dirt that needs to be washed. So you got all this dirt. Somebody give me something else. Come on. Huh? Gossip, which is saying things you should not ought to say about somebody. Oh, you saw him go to church and they, they were wearing that, those super tight jeans. Yeah, those were dirty. They look so smutty. That's wrong. You're not supposed to be talking like that. You're supposed to pray for your sister in Christ. Sin. So now your feet are all dirty. What do you need to do? Wash them. The only way to wash them, right, is by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit needs to convict you of your sin. So we got the convictor over there. So now you're sitting on your bed. You're about to go to sleep in an hour. Now the Holy Spirit's whispering, hey, hey, you need to come pray. You need to come pray. You need to come worship. You need to come. All right, let me get into some worship. It was a great day today. <laughs> Hallelujah, Yeshua, Yeshua. <laughs> Wait, what? I was gossiping. Oh, shoot, that was sin. Oh, he's comforting me, though. Oh, that was sin. Oh, gosh. Oh, all the dirty feet. Oh, oh, oh. That's that cold water. We need some Holy Spirit for water. Hey, oh. Right? All the sins being washed. All the sins being washed because I'm, God, how did I do that? Why did I yell at that person on the road? That, why, I, I thought I overcame that. In the car, I thought I was righteous. That was righteous anger. I thought it was righteous anger. That wasn't righteous anger. I wanted to punch him in their face, right? That's what happens when your conviction of the Holy Spirit begins to convict you. But guess what Jesus' blood is doing? Washing you. Washing you, washing you nice and clean. You're getting washed. A uh, half an hour goes by, an hour goes by. Now it's 11 30, 12 o'clock at night. It's midnight. You prayed for two and a half, three hours. You feel. <sighs> what do you feel? 
fresh. You feel born again, right? <laughs> you feel like, man, I feel amazing. You're high off the Holy Ghost, right? You're like, man, I'm going to get a little snack and go to sleep. <laughs> She's laughing because she, I, that's what I do. I, wake up, I, I got the secret place. Let me get a little cookie real quick. <laughs> For real, right? Get the little, I call it the Holy Spirit munchies, man. For real. You want to go eat a little meal? You didn't, you, you didn't, I, sometimes I didn't even eat my dinner because I was praying, and then my wife got it in the microwave. Got to go warm it up, give me a quick meal, go to sleep. You see what I'm saying, though? I want to give you guys this revelation. I've already been washed when it comes to the blood. I've already, my body's already been washed, but the dirt from throughout the day, the flesh, the world, the devil, the things that I've came in agreement with in my heart, the things that I've actually done that I shouldn't have done, done, it needs to be washed. So I come before the Lord. Now, is the Lord telling me I'm going to hell? No. Is that the Holy Spirit come with a, with a hammer to break my head open? No. The Holy Spirit came and comforted me and said it's okay. He, lead, he led me to the truth. He convicted me of sin. And by doing this, I show God that I love him. I love you, God. If you love God, you'll want to follow his commandments. You won't follow his commandments so that he loves you. That's religion. If you think you got to follow God's commandments so that he loves you, that's not, that's not love. But when you love God, that's when you have a fire. And so now I'm washed. Now I'm like, God, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to get on that road to, and, and, and get angry and, and, and curse somebody out again. I don't want to do that. I don't want to gossip. I don't want to look too long. So what's going to happen a few days from now? I'm going to get tested again. And now, look. You got the guy on the road. I'm driving. Oh, yeah. Holy Spirit says be careful. Oh, yeah. I remember that a few nights ago. Drive by him. How you doing, sir? God bless you. <laughs> test pass. Right? The testing comes before the blessing. Hallelujah. All right. I wanted to give you guys again this, this physical this imagery so that you guys will never forget that, yes, you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You've been washed completely clean. You've been sanctified, made holy, made perfect, made righteous. But we are being washed. Our feet are being washed daily as we do what? Confess. What's going on, family? If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit that bell icon for notifications. Make sure to like the video and comment whatever you received from this video that blessed you. Also, we have another YouTube channel for our ministry, RROC International. Man, we're spreading fire throughout the nations. Make sure to go subscribe. And also, we have Remnant Music Records, Holy Spirit-filled music and times Remnant music that you can go follow and enjoy. So if you haven't already, join us on school. S-K-O-O-L, and make sure to join either the Leadership School of Revival or R-R-O-C International to get plugged in what we're doing all around the world through The Rock. Thank you for all those who partner in prayer and financially. If you'd like to contribute to this ministry, you can look down below in the description and click the giving options to sow into what we're doing here at The Rock, winning souls and sparking revival all around the world. And lastly, if anyone reaches out to you asking for money, it is a scam. Do not give them money. All our giving options are down below. God bless you guys. I love you guys. May the Lord continue to grow you in intimacy with the knowledge of him. In Jesus' name, amen.